Our time is precious. Your time is precious. Do you people ever eat? Or do you just sit here all day? Do you ever eat? Please eat something sometime today. I've been thinking a lot about 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul actually uses the words in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that things are going from bad to worse. This is what he tells Timothy. Things will go from bad to worse. And um, as he tells Timothy this, he he says uh, something to him, and I just want to focus our attention on this, and I want to ask you a question related to it. I don't have my glasses, so I can't see anyway. But he's telling Timothy, in light of all this, he's telling him to remember what he has been taught. And he says to Timothy that you have been acquainted with the sacred writings from the time of your childhood. And it's as if Paul's saying to him, uh, you have a constant companion who will be with you during these challenging times that are going to come, and it's the Word of God. It's never failed you. It's never let you down. Stay close to it. So, I'd like each of you to just reflect on this task of how do we help people uh, in formal education, in the church, in informal settings, how do we help people become acquainted with the Holy Scriptures? And we can go, I was going to say beauty before age. <laughs> we'll start with you, Professor Saleng saying. Well, one way to help Christians become acquainted uh, through education, as we do at RBC, is by helping students to, as Westminster Larger Catechism question 157 says, help them have a firm persuasion that they are reading the very Word of God. And so we can help students or students and readers of Scripture can properly read the Word of God by developing that conviction. And if we read the Word of God with that conviction, if we see the truth, goodness, and beauty that the Word of God is the very Word of God, then we will read it with that conviction, remember it, meditate upon it, contemplate it, and pray it to God. And so, that will cultivate a love for the very Word of God, and so retain that love, becoming acquainted with it by reading it reverently with meditation and prayer. Professor Salang Sang is one of ours and went out to Westminster Seminary, California, has come back. Next to him is Dr. Matthew Dudrick, our professor of New Testament. So, go ahead, Dr. Dudrick. You know, in that passage, just in the verse prior, he talks about how remember what you have learned and become convinced of and who you've learned it from. And it ties in so much the importance of understanding that when we read the pages of Scripture, we're not just simply reading dry history or collection of facts, but we're reading family history. You know, Timothy, when he was a small boy, likely at the age of five as a Jewish boy, he would have understood and when he began to learn the Torah. And what he was reading was the history of his covenant family. And so when we read the pages of Scripture that we're reading family history, it reminds me of a little self-published book that my grandfather once wrote called My Three Fathers. And it was distinctive that each kind of era of his father's life had a distinctive personality to it. And I think about the covenantal structure of the Old and New Testament and how we're reading every single stage of a shift in our family's life. Now understand it's all part of one organic narrative of redemption that God is bringing to its ultimate consummate end. And so we need to be reading Scripture, understanding this. It's not something removed from us, but it is our family history. It's our covenantal family history. Thank you. And next to Dr. Dudrick is our Dr. Keith Matheson. R.C. called him his caveman because he would be in that cave and just pumping out great writing all the time. He's now RBC's caveman, and so we're glad to have him. So, Dr. Matheson. I'm not going to do a caveman impression, but uh, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the things I note when I read that passage is it says from his childhood. And if you go back to the opening paragraph of that book of Timothy, it mentions his mother and his grandmother and how faithful they were. 
um, one of the ways we can help Christians become acquainted is to encourage them to teach their children or their grandchildren from the time they're very small. Don't just read it for yourself. Read it, dig into it, meditate, pray over it, but also read it to ch children, even before they're able to read or even before you think they can understand it and have this being seeped into their consciousness and bring them to bring them to church the back in acts 15 we read that the that Moses is read in the synagogue every sabbath day so for the for a jewish boy like that if he's getting that daily being told uh, the the bible stories and sung the psalms and gathering together on the synagogue on the sabbath it's a constant immersion in the word of god and uh, so i think that's part of what Paul's getting at with that. And so I, I think just encouraging Christians, encouraging yourself to remember the next generation and the generation after that. Thank you. And next to Dr. Matheson is our academic dean, Dr. John Tweedale. Uh, one of the things that we say at the college is we want our students to end their time at RBC with a greater love for Jesus than when they started. When you look at Paul's teaching to Timothy, he's essentially passing the torch. He tells Timothy, Timothy, you need to remember what you have taught, been taught, so that you would continue in the faith, so that you would guard the sacred deposit. When you go back and you look at the Reformation, you realize it was a reformation of the church, it was a reformation of the university, and it was a reformation of the family and of the home. And those three things, those great institutions conspire together for the discipleship of those who come after us, right? We want our students, we want our children to surpass us in their commitment to Christ. And so, at RBC, what we often say is that we come alongside families and we come alongside churches in order to disciple the students you all bring to us. And so we have to think of the Reformation in the totality of these works, of the church, of the university, of the home, so that we tell our students, remember what you've been taught, but continue what you've been taught. Thank you. I believe every Bible college should have a rabbi, and we have our very own rabbi. We have Dr. Benjamin Shaw, who teaches Old Testament, so Dr. Shaw. I think as, as I approach it, I, I want my students to take the Bible seriously, but not too seriously, but then more seriously. What I mean by that is that there's a tendency to be afraid of not taking the Bible seriously enough, uh, that we, you know, we always want to be sober and responsible when we look at the Bible. But when Balaam's donkey begins to talk to him, that's funny. When Jesus says, if a blind man leads a blind man, they'll both fall into the ditch, that's funny. So that you don't, want to, you don't want to miss the humor in the Bible, but then by taking it more seriously, you need to remember that that humor is not just for entertainment, but to make a serious point. And so I, I try to inculcate that uh, in my classes. In that passage, Paul also talks about how some folks are always learning, never arriving at the truth. And in education, we are in the truth business. We want truth that transforms lives, absolutely, to be sure. Uh, we have a little tagline around here, renewing your mind, uh, because renewing your mind leads to a transformed life. And so, we understand that. But crucial to that is what we teach content and truth. It's been a challenging year. It's been a difficult year. Uh, we, we look across culturally and even in the church. It might not be uh, inaccurate to say truth, concept of truth, is under attack, perhaps even lost altogether. 
Would any of you just care to comment on truth in culture, in the church where we find ourselves, what we're trying to do at RBC? And this is a free-for-all, anyone who wants to jump in. There's a, a verse in Second uh, Kings 17 which tells about the uh, destruction of the northern kingdom where uh, the Lord has sent lions in among those who have been relocated to the area that had been inhabited by the northern kingdom. And so they send for a priest to come and teach them how to worship the Lord. And the paragraph ends saying that we, the people, worshiped the Lord but they served their own gods. And that's, you know, when you've got people in your churches who are worshiping the Lord but serving their own gods. There's nothing new under the sun. And so I, there, there's a tendency perhaps to be afraid of our current situation. No reason to be. The people, the people of God have been facing this every generation. Uh, and so be encouraged. Uh, be, be bold. Clap for that, please. Just, just to piggyback on what Dr. Shaw was saying, when you look at Second Timothy 3, you realize um, Paul is preparing Timothy for a life of hardship. If you are going to pursue a godly life in Christ you will be persecuted, is what he says. And so, it's in that context he gives us his great statement on the doctrine of Scripture that all Scripture has been breathed out by God and is therefore profitable for every good work. It is important as we face moral and theological problems that we cannot equivocate in our commitment to the truth of God's Word. We need to give people confidence that they can trust their Bibles, and it's God's Word that transforms His people. And so, we've got to remind people of the centrality of the Word of God in the life of the Christian. Have you noticed that professors talk with their hands? Have you noticed that? Dr. Tweedell often will do our chapel introductions, and he, he uses a handheld to do these introductions. And I end up usually hearing about every third word <laughs> because he gets very expressive <laughs> with his sermonic gestures. Is that true, Dr. Tweedale? That, that is true. I, I actually thought, is there a way I could actually tie this arm just to my chest so I'm not doing this today, but… <laughs> I'd say you're doing very well, so I, I appreciate that. There is biblical wisdom here. There is biblical wisdom to be gained uh, for the people of God as we engage these things. There's also historical wisdom to be gained here. I'm going to take a step back here, and we're just going to do maybe some lightning round questions, and I'm going to throw some questions at you. Feel free to jump in. If you could think of two or three books that would be helpful for people to engage, what would they be? Anyone can jump in. Not not books of the biblical canon. A good hymnal. Hmm. Um, I was just talking to somebody a few minutes before here who is an editor of a Psalter hymnal that the OPC and URC put together. So you get God's inspired hymnal and the Psalms, and then you get the great hymns of the church in one volume. How about that? It's a reminder that we are intended to praise God. Theology, as Dr. Matheson will say, is for doxology. So every, every household here needs a good hymnal. If you don't have one, buy another one. And then if you know somebody who doesn't have one, buy one for them. So have a hymnal. There is no way I can limit this to just two books, but I've been involved in a project for almost a year now that has, 
I've been reading a lot of the old 16th and 17th century Reformed authors and Puritans, and it's been a delight. But I would encourage you in, to go back and read, read these guys because we tend to romanticize that era, and they, they were going through some quite dramatic difficulties uh, in the 16th century with, with Roman Catholic persecution and the persecution of the emperor and everything going on in England that the Puritans had to deal with is, uh, makes what we're dealing with pale in comparison. If I were to pick a couple of the Puritans to suggest, uh, I've read so many of them, if you can imagine a horse race, I, Thomas Watson was all, always my favorite. I still recommend him. But on the outside, Thomas Brooks came running up, and he's running neck and neck with Watson at this point. And Watson, uh, uh, Brooks's book, Precious Remedies for Satan's Devices, is just outstanding. Mm. Um, but he has six whole volumes, so I'm, I'm going to recommend one book, and that's his five or six volume set uh, of <laughs> Thomas Brooks. That's how I'm going to limit it. Uh, by, the, by a one, one book, it's five volumes. I'm just picturing you being a commentator for horse races now. I think you've just found a, another side gig there, Dr. Matheson. Sec Secretariat coming around. <laughs> 38 links. And you didn't say Lord of the Rings. I didn't say the Lord of the Rings, although I, I always recommend that book. Um, but that's but a for given. Different we'll just know that's a given. One book that has continually stirred my love for the Word of God, to stir my heart, uh, to renew my mind, to meditate, contemplate, and revere the Word of God, is a 17th-century pastor and poet, George Herbert, and I heartily recommend his book of poetry called The Temple, and in it has three poems I recommend to you, two of which are on Holy Scripture, and I assure you he will inflame your heart with a loveliness and sweetness of the Word of God, and love the third, and that is a pastor who expressed his thankfulness for the Word of God uh, through poetry, so George Herbert's The Temple. I'll recommend two books and then a set of poems. Um, the first book is G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy, uh, and I, understand, I, I know that he became a Roman Catholic, but it was after he wrote that book. Um, but it's, it's a personal apologetic for why he became a Christian and what it did to him uh, and his understanding of the world. Uh, the second book would be Dorothy Sayers' book, The Nine Tailors which is a wonderful mystery, but it is also a wonderful illustration of the doctrine of providence. I won't say any more. I'll just leave it to you. Uh, and then John Donne's Holy Sonnets. Um, if you've not read them, uh, your life is poorer. I'm thinking about two books that I would recommend. Uh, maybe I'm showing my Westminster bona fides here, but uh, one, just kind of the great richness of the Dutch Reformed tradition, but uh, uh, the wonderful works of God by Herman Bavink, a great introduction to that heritage of theological uh, tradition. And then even more formative for me personally uh, is uh, Gerhardus Voss's uh, Biblical Theology and just how the beautiful picture of the unified organic nature of Scripture, how we have a, s a single narrative that runs from Genesis to Revelation and how that gives us a framework for understanding Scripture, uh, two great books. Bavink and Voss, Dutch. I just met someone out uh, in the narthex that informed me that Adam and Eve spoke Dutch in the Garden of Eden. I didn't know that. Who knew? <laughs> I think about, I have an 18-year-old, 16-year-old. I think about the world they're growing up in. It is so different from the world I grew up in. I think of the issues they face, uh, we did not talk much about transgenderism when I was in high school. You are, are, are training this next generation. They're coming to us from contexts that are very different, and I think they're entering into contexts that are going to be different than what, what many of us have experienced. How do you think about that in terms of your role in discipling these students that come to us? And I know we have the, the, the anchor of God's Word and the eternal abiding biblical wisdom. How do we apply that in, to our students' lives and help them see it, especially given 
this moment and what may lie ahead for them. I mentioned this to some of my students in class just the other day that it's really, I'm 53, it's really hard for me to imagine how fast things have changed since I was in high school 35 years ago and today. And it's, it's, it makes it almost impossible to predict what that generation is going to have to face by the time they're my age and what their children are going to have to be looking at. But the focus, I, I try to, it, 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 this is where history is helpful. You get that historical perspective that we were talking about. Every generation of Christians has faced something, and every nation, and there are Christians all over the world right now facing things far worse than we're having to deal with, and there always are. And I tried to remind them, you know, when you're in the middle of these cultural storms, you need that solid place to stand on. You let go of the Word of God, you let go of Christ, and you start looking elsewhere for truth and your standards of truth and goodness, and you're just going to be tossed about by the wind and the waves as well. We, we have to focus, and deliberately so, on that which is unchanging, because every culture, every, we, I can't predict what the seniors at RBC are going to face 10 years from now. It, it could be something unimaginable to us right now. But if they stay firm, holding firm to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of God's word, to the truth of God, then no matter what comes their way, they've got a solid, unchanging anchor point. So it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to encourage all of us to, to hold fast to that which is firm, and then come what may. You know, we, as, as Dr. Shaw says, we don't have to be afraid of this. The world has a lot to be afraid of, but they're afraid of the wrong things. They're afraid of economic collapse, diseases, you name it. They're not afraid of God as they should be. That's, we need to have a healthy fear of God, and clinging to that, um, that uh, provides a, a, a starting point for us with these students. And, and it helps us to address whatever issues come along. We need to address things that we can't predict, but if we have that solid foundation of wisdom, we can do that. Yeah, I think building off of what Keith said, that there's, there's the temptation uh, to find our truth in whatever the current cultural norms are. And part of our responsibility here at RBC is to, to say to the students, no, that's not the norm for truth. The norm for truth is God's Word. And it's not loving to encourage your neighbor in his sin. It's not loving to encourage a fool in his folly. Um, and so, and, and that's hard when the whole culture is telling you this is right and the Scripture is telling you, no, it's not. It is. It's difficult to hold to what Scripture says, but that's what we're called to. And I, I think as, as faculty here at RBC, as pastors in your churches, we need to model that to those that we are discipling uh, who have been trusted into our care. At RBC, one way that we help students apply the Word of God and see how it makes them wise unto salvation is by introducing them to the great works of literature. When students read the great works of literature, they have the opportunity to cultivate prudence, wisdom, and realize how all of truth is God's truth, all goodness is God's goodness, and all beauty uh, is God's beauty. And so when students read a great work like Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. They have the opportunity to use their imagination and cultivate convictions as to what is true, good, and beautiful unchangeably according to the Word of God. And so in such great works of literature, our students have the opportunity to learn how God's Word is lovely, sweet, and wise. And so they can repudiate pride and prejudice as false, evil, and grotesque in light of God's Word revealing what is actually and unchangeably true, good, and beautiful. And in that way, students can cultivate the prudence so that they can learn to apply the Word of God in all of life. I, 
As we're talking about what it means to be a witness in this world, we, we have to again come back to our confidence in the gospel and offer the greatest news in the world to those who do not know Jesus Christ. We hold out good news and we need to proclaim it. All who come to Jesus Christ will be saved. Any who come to Christ will be saved, but only those who come to Christ will be saved. And so, dear friends, we know that God has never rejected anyone who comes to Christ in faith and repentance, but He will reject everyone who rejects His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in a day where we're facing tremendous unbelief, we need to be crystal clear in offering the good news of Jesus Christ to those who desperately need Him. As you were mentioning Jane Austen, I'm looking at three Jane Austen fans. One of them is your wife. I think you did that just for her. I'm very proud of you. Um, we have two minutes. We heard a great answer on what is discipleship by John MacArthur. I think he was sitting in this very chair. I'm hoping there's some osmosis here, so that's why I'm glad I had this chair. But he mentioned content but also in life on life can enhance that content. As you think about, you're a discipler of, of students, but you are also disciples. So, living or dead influences on you that have, a, have had an impact on you in your own discipleship. We'll just go right down the line as our last question. Immediately what comes to mind with thankfulness in God's providence is when I was a student at Reformation Bible College, I had the dear privilege and delight to be under my dear colleague, Dr. Matheson, and he influenced me to love the Word of God in such a way as to always respond in worship in doxology. And I'm grateful for Dr. Matheson's example and as well as modeling that in the classroom and outside the classroom. And as a faculty member now, it's my privilege to reciprocate that and uh, serve students to show them how to love and find the Word of God as sweet and to respond to the Word of God with doxology. Let's see, if I think about major spiritual influences, discipleship influence, I think about um, a scholar that I spent a lot of time with, uh, my advisor, Greg Beal to see the beauty of the unity of Scripture, uh, how, in a sense, the same story, the same narrative goes throughout the entire Scriptures, that we see our own uh, redemption in its pages. Um, if, uh, I think about a pastor of mine from back in Illinois. Uh, his name's Dave, and uh, just the incredible uh, access and openness that he had with me when I was a very young Christian, uh, and just investing his life, pouring his life into mine, and kind of treating me as a kind of Timothy figure was very, very influential for me. My, my pastors over the years, um, and most recently, Dr. Sproul and, and Bert Parsons, just watching uh, faithful pastors who proclaim the Word faithfully week in and week out, and to faithfully disciple and lead the church day in and day out. And, and, and watching that example was an enormous influence on me, and it, it has been from the first pastor I had all the way down to my present pastor. Uh, reading Calvin helped me love Scripture. Reading Owen helped me love Christ. And then serving with Derek Thomas helped me love the church. John Gerstner, both as a teacher and as a Christian, um, had, has had the most profound effect on me. So, Dr. Shaw was with Dr. Gerstner for his last three years of teaching at Pittsburgh Seminary. So, you were his last student for the full complement of his teaching. So, I was hoping you would say, the man who growled. John Gershner. Could you join me in thanking our faculty for this time?